Good morning. Good morning. See you all. Tanse and Totim, Gaki Okan, Scott Noel. Um, um, we, I guess we, we all have our different protocols when we get together, things that we do. So we gave Ramona some tobacco just, uh, just to voice a blessing, I guess, for what we're trying to do here and uh, um, just to connect in a different way maybe. So I asked Ramona to say a prayer. Okay, get to connect with Tim Upa. Stand the goat, get to see Skak. It's again that I am Ramona Bighead. My Blackfoot name is Agusti Skak, and it translates into many sweat lodge woman. Um, I come from the. Um, we are like the larger Blackfoot, but in particularly, our people are the Ganai people. And those were the people that you, you met yesterday. Um, I'm going to say a prayer uh, in my own language, my own indigenous language. <laughs> and um, yeah, so the things I'll be praying for is thanking Istibatabio, who the, the translation, if you want to call it God, Creator, the literal translation is Tibatabio is the source of life. And I'm going to call on Istibata Biop today and Natuita Beaks. Natuita Beaks are, maybe you think of them as angels. We call them our grandfathers and our grandmothers who once walked this earth, but they're now in that spirit realm. And we also call on them for guidance. So I call on, I would call on people like my dad who's gone on, my mother, uh, many others that are important to me. Um, my grandparents, I will call on them to to come and, and help us in however they, they help from that side, but we do believe that they do help us. Um, and I will be asking for um, <coughs> blessings for everybody here <coughs> and also for, for all of you, your families, your, your back home, you, you, you are all far from home. And um, I'll be asking for blessings for that as well and that you'll have safe travels home and that whatever it is you've come here for to this gathering that you will be able to go home with that find some of the answers or even more questions that you never thought of before that you'll be able to take that home with you and do well with your own communities so i'll i'll pray <coughs> I na tui te pigs. I kyo kent skats matapinna na taksis kanatuni. I upita. I o mukina. I o kipita ki kyo kent skats matapinna. O kme istakats na kututs pumstad. Kikautan. A pesapia ki. Siki mi kitopi. Tatsi kistomi. Kim mat do kina na kutut spomo kina na naksist ko. Kim mat do kina da ko kwan stay ka kim akpinan. Da ko kwan stay ka kim atu pinan ni tatsi mo iskan ni non kini patbi sin non. Og na katutu to kaman mo ksi kano to ya. Kim mat do sa. Kim mat do sa tukyabs kim maks. Og oswa wax upita mo wax unapi mo wax og utitapi mo wax. Kim mat do sa aksapia. O ki mah koksi tam skut kaya. O ki na katuto to kaman nisto nuku six nisto nuku six. Tiksi kim matap spinna nisti pati piop nuksi kim matu kinan. O kim matu sa apio mah ka. Kim matu sa mah koksi nista ika kima koksi kai ka kima tum utis kini matok sini. O ki kim matu kinan ta koksi nista ika kima kpinan. Noksi akyo kinan nisti da betis tutu pinan is kin nisti nukta swaksi tak spinan. Og nuk kuk kinan kim ma pipitsin i dami beti pisin. Ach si beti pisin. O kis pummo kinan en oksis tsikoy. Da koksi ka kimakpinan moksak si tsipsatanan. Da koksi ka kimakpinan 
takak isu ke istimat sanan ki stun non ki pet pe sanon o ke ke matu ke nan an aksis ko o ks pomo ke nan da kok sit tam sku takai spinani da mep sitikai spinano kun nanis o ke si pet pe ops pomo ke nan ke matu ke nan o ke kamutan nis to ats mana pe os ni This is going to be pretty informal and also very improvised. And I, I just um, I've been thinking a lot about what you folks are all working on and how much I admire that and uh, how I can help um, with some of the things that you're puzzling on. And I think um, just a few things for you to understand um, is, first of all, my work is in curriculum studies. So uh, for us, at the university I'm at, the curriculum studies has a long tradition uh, and it has to do, of course, with what we think is important for people to know and how they should know that. But as you know, most of that is influenced by enlightenment-based understandings of what it means to be a human being. Right? So one of the ways I define curriculum is stories we tell about the world and our place in it. And so my role at the university I'm at, the University of Alberta, has mostly been to try and um, not so much undermine or trouble enlightenment-based philosophies, but to try to get some balance. And so, you know, because I lived and worked alongside, you know, people in Ramona's community, I was really influenced by a lot of Blackfoot understandings and experiences that I had. But of course, I'm back home now, and uh, more and more, my understandings of, of Cree worldview are, are there. And so part of what you know, I'm going to share with you is, is influenced by that, is that idea of what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to live a good life? And um, you know, part, part of the challenge, of course, is, is um, to try to think about the relationship. So this is part of what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to talk about here uh, if I get a chance. This is a, this is a kind of a I guess you could call it a heuristic, right, or a, a conceptual understanding that I've tried to use quite a bit in different ways. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges here, and I think it shows up in all kinds of public settings these days as well, is that I can't think of any experience that I've had with a kind of a depth engagement with indigenous knowledge whatever you might, you know, for, for me, it's, it's um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn more about that Cree understanding and, and uh, you've learned from Ramona the last few days, but I can't think of any indigenous expression of knowledge or knowing that is secular. So in that sense, um, the understanding is if you leave out the spirit, well, it's almost like a flat tire, right? What you're working on isn't going to go anywhere. That's, that's the way we were taught. That's the way I continue to be taught, and I know Ramona has been influenced that way. So we have this fundamental part of what it means to be a human being that gets left out of a lot of discussions. And, and of course, you know, in the settings that I work in, many people are uncomfortable with thinking about spirit and what it might, how it might help us. And so this is part of the project, right, is how do we do this, right? Um, but just... Um, just one thing I asked you to, I would ask you to think about in relation to this is that, um, you know, there, we, we've learned there's been lots of damage that's been done as a result of colonialism and colonial logics. So one of the ways I define colonialism is an, it's an extended process of denying relationships. And so the implications of those relationships are, they are human to human, of course, you know, colonial ideology teaches us to separate ourselves from people who don't look like us or don't, don't speak like us or don't pray like us. But it's also a separation of ourselves from what gives us life. 
Right? That, I, I, my, my view is that's a fundamental part of the colonial project. Uh, and it's also the separation of your head from the rest of your body, which has been a very successful division or split that's happened. And so, like, I'm well aware that, that part, of, part of the trouble with engaging in these discussions is we can get bogged down in the, in the critique, right? Uh, and this is something I talk to my students about. Like, it's one thing to say what the problem is, but it's another thing to say what you think we should do instead, right? So that's, that's what I try to focus on. Understand the critique, but what do we do instead? So the project then becomes, if I understand colonial ideology in the ways that I've just mentioned, the project becomes repairing those relationships and renewing them, constantly renewing them. So this is what I think I do, or what I try to do. Right? And this is something, as you know, you've probably been learning, we have had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, and we've also had a series of what they call 94 Calls to Action, which is specific challenges to educational institutions in this country to engage with indigenous themes, issues, experiences, all those things. But here, here's something I ask you to think about that's very fundamental to this work, and here's the way I would describe it, is that you have one knowledge system And let's say at the top of that knowledge system is somebody who has a PhD. So, you know, we start this knowledge system and there's different stages to it. We go through different processes. You start in kindergarten and you, and you move your way up. And so this is, this is an expression of, of a knowledge system. And my thing is always to say, um, you know, I don't want to um, <coughs> pathologize this, right? or villainize this process, because I've benefited a lot from it as well. I, I'm part of it, right? But to understand it, and to understand the cultural assumptions that circulate in that. So now, if somebody says, OK, now we need to learn more about indigenous something, right? So we have, we have a different knowledge system. And you know, Blackfoot and Cree, they have a lot in common, but they're also very distinct in important ways, right? But the process maybe we could outline it in a similar way, right? Except in this case, we might have somebody we call a ceremonial elder, somebody who's led in those ways. They've, they've committed their lives to the study. They have that experience with guiding people. They have recognized in those ways they've had these rights transferred to them. It looks like I put more stages on this side. Anyway. So we have our own rites of passage. We have our own ways of people working through the system. But here's what's happening right now. This is my observation. And I think this relates to the work that you're doing, is that what's happening in a lot of universities who are interested in truth and reconciliation is they're inviting elders to come to public institutions, and they're speaking to people with PhDs. And what's happening is these elders are being asked to assimilate their knowledge so that these people can understand it. So it's, it's like uh, another form of assimilation. So talk to us in a way that will convince us that what you're saying matters to us, right? So conform what you want to say. Speak to us in a way that, that we can fit it into what we already know. This is, this is what's happening right now, and it's happening consistently. Right? And so what, the el what some of the elders I work with who, who kind of avoid this situation is they say, we have all kinds of generations of people who haven't had access to any of this information because of all the stuff that's gone on, all the trouble, language, culture, ceremonies. And so we have, we have, we have to start with a kind of a grassroots approach where we have to try to build this knowledge system again. Instead of feeding this one, Right? What they say is that elders are getting skinnier and skinnier because they're, they're giving themselves so much to this project. Right? So it's about balance. Right? It's about trying to make it so that both knowledge systems can operate in the ways that they do and, then, and they can communicate to each other in a balanced kind of a way. That was kind of the vision, and that's part of what I'll, I'll get to here in a bit. So this is, this is a problem we have right now. Right? that uh, I think uh, if we don't pay attention to it, it's going to become more and more serious. But my, 
my major project, I would say, uh, has to do with the kind of human being we have in mind. So what I try to do is I try to pay attention to the wisdom that's associated with uh, local indigenous people and the names that they have for themselves. For, so for example, Blackfoot people, they call themselves Nititapi. So my question would be, what kind of imagination is provoked when somebody says that? In other words, what kind of human existence of a good life are they speaking when they say Nititapi? And my experience with that is that that is a deeply ecological understanding, which means that it's about fitting in to what's already in motion in this area, right? And so it, it's, it's a very different kind of orientation to what gives us life that I'm interested in. And of course, Cree people have the same thing. We call ourselves Nihia, Nihiawak. So then what I try to do is understand the etymology of that word, what it can teach us about what those people know about how to live well in that particular area, and then how we can proceed on that. And, and again, my idea isn't to convert everybody to be Cree, right? Just in the same way the idea isn't to convert everybody to be Blackfoot, because we're all different and it needs to, it needs to stay that way. We learn from each other, but we don't need to assimilate, right? But the idea is, is of course, we've got all kinds of people coming into these ecological areas who don't have any experience with the gifts that are associated with it as indigenous people know them. And so what I try to do is I try to give people opportunities to connect with those gifts. And I was talking about this with Gabriella yesterday. It's this idea that uh, the distinction between assuming that you can change the way someone thinks by telling them that they should change the way that they think, right, as opposed to giving them things, supports, doing things together in a performative way, right, performing knowledge, and giving people opportunities to live their lives differently. And that's, that's what causes a change in how you think and how you engage. So that's, that's been my commitment, right? And I, I just wanted to, I just, over here, I just noted a couple of Cree, Cree words um, that I, I reflect on a lot. And this, 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 again, I think this goes to a central tension. You know, so, so if I was to try and encourage you to do the work you know, with indigenous communities in your local area that I know some of you are trying to do, and the idea that you can embed yourself in that local knowledge and use it as a way to kind of encounter other, other things that you have. Uh, one of the ways, of course, is through language and the connections to language. So this is the way you, you refer to the creator in Cree, Simantu, we say, which simply, you could say God, right? But the, I think the more detailed translation is it's the great mystery, right? Right? And so, so part of the knowledge system is to tap into the great mystery. That's what they say, right? So, so this, this prefix here refers to something great or something beyond our imagination, right? Underneath it here, this is the word for compassion, tsiwatsuan. So that's how you say, and that would be a simple translation. So, so this is another great mystery connection, right? Compassion. And I'll, I'll give you a, a sort of a, a practical reflection of, of how I'm thinking about this, and then I'll, I'll bring it back. I was watching a documentary film uh, a few weeks ago, and it was on the um, Mekong River. And what the, what the woman in the film did is she started uh, at the Delta, and she traveled upriver, and she traced it all the way to its origins in, in, the t in Tibet. It's a very interesting documentary. It was a BBC production. And as she traveled the river, she went along, and she just checked in with the local people about their relationship to the river and all those things. But when she got to Tibet, she was working with some Buddhist monks and interviewing them. And she said, uh, at one point, she said to them through the help of a translator, how would you feel about this river that you consider sacred if I told you that 2,000 miles down river, it's polluted and full of garbage and, and all that. And his response was, well, they must be people who live without compassion. And I, I thought about that in relation to this, because the way I understand this is that the act of creation, all the gifts that we have, was the, is the original act of compassion. 
in the sense that we were given a way to live. We were given a series of gifts as a way to survive, right? And there's all kinds of networks of stories that we have that connect to that, right? And so when you act according to the teachings of that original act of creation, you act in that original act of kindness, right? So that means that you, you try to respect all forms of life. That's what compassion means in this, in this case, right? So when you act that way, you're honoring those original teachings, or what we could say is natural law, right? And of course, it, it applies not just to humans, but to all forms of life that surround us, right? So that, that's just one like, small example of something that I continue to puzzle on. I'll, I'll just uh, quickly share a few other things, and then I'll get to this. Um, there's a couple of courses that I teach. One is called, uh, it's a doctoral seminar. It's called Notions of Knowledge and Knowing. And uh, what we try to do is we try to break down knowledge systems to understand them in their particularities, in the context from which they arise, as a way for them to speak to each other equitably, right? Because, of course, as we know, one of the dynamics that we're constantly confronted with is that something arises in a particular context, it gets removed from there, it gets universalized as common sense in a kind of a paradigmatic way. And then it has a lot of power and control about how we take other things up, right? And it's, it's what causes us to think something is sensible or something else seems silly, right? Because we, we, we conform to these universalized ways, right? So that's what that course is about. I've also taught another course called Holistic Approaches to Life and Living. And this um, is, is based on working very closely with an elder and Cree what I would call wisdom relationality. So there's two assignments that are part of that course, which goes for a whole trip around the sun. We meet every month. So what the students do is they study a place, and their, their task is to go to that place of their choosing as often as they can, and to pay attention to what's happening there. And what the elder does is he informs the different seasons and what's going on and the wisdom associated with it as we work through a whole calendar year. So they, in their own way, pay attention to what's there and they create a record of that. The other thing we do is we study the moons. And, and this, this has had some fundamental changes, I would say, in how people encounter these things. This image here uh, is something that I rely on a lot. So as you can see, th this is the medal that was given out when the treaties were negotiated. So we're in Treaty 7 territory. That was negotiated in 1877. I'm from Treaty 6 territory. It was negotiated the year before. This is a relationship between the Queen of England, her representatives, and the indigenous people here. And there's all kinds of planes of experience and understanding and misunderstanding of what this means. But part of my belief is that in the work that you're doing, the work that I'm doing, you need a vision for, for what it is that that you're working towards. The elder, what he says to me is, Kikwe anoti o pinamen. Kikwe anoti o pinamen, which means, what are you trying to lift? So, so this is the, the original agreement as it is depicted, you know? And the way our people understand it is that, and it's similar for the Blackfoot, is that this was an adoption ceremony. This was not a land surrender. This wasn't a situation where one group you know, gave up everything and the other group benefited from it. This, the way this is understood is an adoption ceremony where we agreed to treat each other as relatives. In Cree we say Kitsewamanawak, which means they became our first cousins through this, this ceremony here. And that's sort of the wisdom understanding of the treaties. And since 1876, 1877, there's been all kinds of terrible things that have happened as a result. But what's happening now in a lot of places is that people are coming back to this. Now that the Canadian government, other officials are asking us again, okay, we've made a lot of mistakes, we want to renew this relationship, and people are saying, well, this is what we should be working for. We're not trying to undermine each other. We're trying to work together. We're trying to balance our relationship. We recognize each other as fellow human beings with different ways of doing things. We're not going to try to change that. This handshake means we're, we're going to try to use our imagination together to try and figure this out. A couple of Cree concepts that are associated with this, this is Miwachituan and Miwakotuan. Very quickly, Miwachituan has to do with um, um, sitting together like we are, 
as, as human beings and facing each other as fellow human beings and, and, and putting ethics, which means uh, enhancing your well-being at the forefront. So it's, it's about respect and it's about a safety, right? And it's about uh, looking after each other, miwachituan. So it's like this healing energy that can flow when we treat each other in that way. Good things that happen from it. Miwakotuin is, is an extension of that. What it means is that we, we have kinship, we're related, right? So that means uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not in your families. I'm not in your extended family, but we're related to each other because we have some very critical things that unify us. But the, other, the key thing with Miwakotuin is that uh, the, human, the human challenge is to constantly extend that kinship outside of human beings to include everything that surrounds us. So that's why in Cree, I can say that tree is my relative and it doesn't sound crazy as it does in English, right? Because it makes sense in this context. So together, I call these in English ethical relationality. That's a concept that when I teach my students and they ask me, how am I supposed to bring you know, newcomer knowledge and indigenous knowledge together? I say, well, here's your, here's your model. It's about balance, it's about respect, it's about re understanding different knowledge systems and different ways of doing things and proceeding in this sort of kinship way that is not just human beings, it's everything that surrounds us. Right? So that's that idea of ethical relationality. I think I've said enough for now. Well, you got to put that thing on. Oh. Okay. Um, well, uh, historically, that Cree man and this Blackfoot woman would not be in this close proximity. <laughs> unless he came into my tribe and, and stole me or something. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I taught with Dwayne. Uh, Early in my teaching career, uh, we both taught at the same high school, the high school that I am now the principal of. Uh, Duane was there uh, when I got there in 96, I think I got there. Duane had already been there for a few years. And then throughout the years, we've just um, always uh, worked together. And um, and then later on, he, um, he left. He left me with all the kids. <laughs> kind of high school, went on to bigger and better things at the University of Alberta. But um, I, 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 I think throughout the years, one of the things I can say is that Duane has always been one of those really contemplative uh, people who really thinks before he says what he has to say. And so when he does talk, I usually make sure I listen. Um, and. Um, and for me, I'm the opposite. I'll just talk and not, not think about what I'm saying. And so, uh, but um, I am um, listening to, to you in, in the conversations that we had yesterday. And also uh, this morning, I had a little glimpse of some of you, uh, what you were sharing. And um, my heart hurts for uh, the indigenous people who are not recognized or even further than that indigenous people who don't even want to recognize themselves as indigenous people here i am i'm i'm so so proud of my who i am as an itsitapiaki you know we talk about the language nitsitapi we call ourselves that i don't call myself blackfoot i don't call that, that's what others have called us um, we call ourselves Nitsitapi, Nitsitapiaki. I'm a, 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 a Nitsitapi, Nitsi means real, the truth. So we say, ah, Nitsi. So if Duane was telling me a story and I'd be listening and we'd be speaking in our language, um, and he would, and I'd say, ah, ah, Nitsi, ah, that's right, that's the truth. So in when we describe ourselves as Nitsitapi or Nitsitapi Aki, Aki is a girl or woman, um, I'm saying I am a real woman. And, um, and so you contrast that with what we named the newcomers. The newcomers in our language are Napiquan. I told you a story about Napi yesterday, right? <laughs> well, Napi, 
it's kind of a little bit crazy sometimes. You kind of look at him and you kind of scratch your head and you just kind of have to just, oh. Well, when the newcomers came, we didn't know what to desc- we didn't know how to describe them. They were just odd. So we called them not Bitcoin because they were kind of crazy too. Because we didn't know what else to do. Dis- we didn't have a reference point. They just didn't belong. But, you know, some of us, out of compassion, took care of them, took them in, you know, not knowing what was going to happen in the future. But um, I was listening to, um, to uh, the stories of. Um, uh, the, the the people being taken from Chile and being brought, you know, other places, and and I think for us, you know, um, we um, I wanted to share with you um, some a little bit of history. Okay, um, in 1870, specifically January 30th. You think it's cold now? Well, January can get really cold. Back then, it was like minus 30 degrees Celsius. So that's pretty cold. I don't know what that translates into you guys, but it's, trust me, it's cold. Uh, very cold. And um, what happened was on January 30th, 1870, and this is what I did my master's uh, uh, research on and I wrote a play about it and this play we traveled you know everywhere to New York and wherever we can go with this play back then anyway um, there was a massacre that took place uh, in if you look at present-day Alberta uh, right across into the United States is the state of Montana there's a, a river there that the Lewis and Clark in 1802, 1804, somewhere in there, they had their great expedition west. Well, they renamed a lot of these rivers and mountains and so on. Uh, we already had names for those places, but they just renamed them. So they named it the Marias River after Aunt Marie from back east somewhere. But the name that w- for us is w- was Gaitai, which means Bear River. So along that Bear River, there was um, 1870, August 1870, that su- or 1869, uh, that just that summer prior to this, there was a lot of skirmishes between the settlers. Settlers were coming in, bringing in their cattle, building fences, and uh, as Duane said, you know, we didn't, our people didn't really understand what's happening. You know, we're, this is our traditional territory. Why can't we hunt there? Why can't we go where we normally would be able to go? And so a lot of these, these um, so there started to be a lot of skirmishes that went back and forth. So uh, back, and then when the army would come in, the United States Cavalry would come in, they would build uh, forts. And, um, you know, they started settling the area on traditional Blackfoot territory. So things were going on back and forth. Uh, one event led to the other. Uh, people were getting killed on both sides. The Blackfoot were going in, uh, attacking uh, white settlers, white traders, and so on, and, and vice versa. So the army was called in. And the orders were given uh, by General Phil Sheridan. Um, and it, it, he's widely attributed as the person who said the only good Indian is a dead Indian. But it wasn't really him that said it, but his, in his policies on Indian people, it, he, he had that view. So on this day, even though it happened on January 30th, the orders were given as early as October. And the reason why I know this is in my research, I was able to look at some of the actual telegrams that were sent from uh, Chicago, where uh, Phil Sheridan's offices were, and sent down to, into west to Montana. So they came in, and they attacked a camp, and the camp was Chief Heavy, Run- Heavy Runner's camp, Isukuyo Mahka, that was his name. That was his camp. And where I live in Cardston, Alberta, which is about 15, 20 minutes from the border, if I drive from my house to the site of where this massacre took place, it'll probably take me about 
about a, about a couple hours to drive there, go into Montana. And I can we go we actually go to this site, and um, so. Phil, or Phil Sheridan was the general, and he was in charge of, of the entire west, from Chicago west right to the coast, um, north uh, to, of course, the Canadian boundaries, and south until whatever that Mexican border was in 1870. But he had, that was his kind of his area he was in charge of. And at that time, he was lobbying the United States government to take over. Uh, he wanted the, the Bureau or the Department of Indian Affairs. I'm not sure what they call it in the United States, but he wanted that to be put under the, the army. He, as a general, wanted to be the one to say what was going to happen to all the Indian people across that whole land. Almost happened until this. So send, he sent his troops to uh, Montana State and said the general, uh, the major he had in charge was Major Eugene Baker. And he said, tell Baker to strike them and to strike them hard. So the camp that Major Baker and his troops were looking for was a guy named, um, a Blackfoot named um, Owl Child. Because Owl Child had killed a prominent citizen in the state of, a white citizen in the state of Montana. so. Um, Baker and his troops were looking for Owl Child. They had heard that Owl Child was being harbored or, or hidden in the camp of a man named Mountain Chief. So they sent some scouts out a few days prior to to go check out the area to try and find Mountain Chief's camp. They found it, but in the days that it took from, for, Mountain, or for the scouts to get back to the fort, which was about maybe three, four day journey from where the camp was back to the fort. And remember, it's winter. From the time it took to get back, let them know I found Mountain Chief's camp for the army to assemble themselves and to get to the camp uh, to look for Owl Child. The camp had moved. Meanwhile, Isukuyuma, a heavy runner, had moved into that same place. And so when the army arrived a few days later, in the early morning hours, and Chief Heavy Runner was, he, he thought that he could go to the, to, the, to the army, to the superintendent of Indian Affairs, or whatever he was called at that time, and he says, look, can you write me a piece of paper? You guys seem to really like the paper. You know, can you write me something on there that I could show, that shows that I got no, no issues with the whites? I'm a peaceful chief, I, don't, I got no problems with you, you people, but can you write something that says that? So the, the superintendent wrote, gave it to him. So when the army had arrived, they were kind of like, if you, uh, where it happened, there's the river. They kind of came over the bluffs or the cliffs there, and they were looking down at the camp. And um, heavy runner, came out holding that piece of paper to the soldiers who already had their guns aimed at him and it didn't matter they just shot him and that just what as soon as that first shot rang they just all started shooting and um 200 and well the army said tried to say they were mostly um they were mostly warriors that it was a battle, they tried to call it a battle. It wasn't a battle, it was a massacre. And they tried to say that there was, there were mo the all, of all the ones that were killed, there were, there were men, able fighting men that came out to fight. They weren't, most of the men, it was winter time. Most of the men had gone out to go hunt. And, and a lot of the people within the camp were suffering from smallpox. There was a smallpox epidemic around that time. So a lot of the people were, were dying. And so the majority of people that were left in the camp were the old people, the women, and the children. And so when they started shooting, um, they counted, at the end of it, they, you know, not only did they shoot the people, but they um, burnt their lodges. Um, they call it total warfare. Apparently it's a war strategy. If you watch the G Gone with the Wind, you know, those old movies back then, um, you'll see that that's a, a strategy that the army used to just to really just decimate and subjugate the people. Kill them <laughs> and, and burn everything. Took all their horses, 
they counted like about 2,000 horses that were taken by the army. But um, most, the survivors were children, like that age and younger. And most of them went running to the banks of the frozen river with their bare hands digging in to try and find a place to shield themselves from the bullets. And a lot of those, you know, you talk about those soldiers taking the children. Well, these same soldiers who just, who just orphaned these children gathered some of them and took them. And you look at the, you look at the books, uh, the phone book of, of Browning, the Blackfeet people, the last names of the people are the same last names as those same soldiers who, who shot them, shot their ancestors. So what a, why, why was this so important to me? One of the survivors was a little girl. Her name was Holy Bear Woman. Not the Holy Bear Woman eventually came into Canada on the Canadian side of Blackfoot territory. Um, and she, she, she married a, a settler, uh, uh, he was like a, like a merchant, trader, and she had a son. I don't know, you know, I haven't been able to find out, and I've talked to a few people, and I can't find his, his Blackfoot name, but his name was Charlie Blood. They, na they gave him this name when they put him into the Indian residential school, but I haven't been able to find out what his name was. Charlie had a daughter, her name was Annie, uh, and she became Annie Bershenbone. Her Blackfoot name was Kikawotan, means white shield. Annie had a son, his name was Peter Big Head. Mate Stockotts, Crow Arrow. And Peter Big Head was my dad. And those are my grandchildren. One, their dad, two, three, four, five, six, seven generations back. Uh, when we talk about our history, these stories, it's not, you know, people say, well, that was a long time ago. Happened to those people over there. It doesn't touch us, it, you know, it's, it's over there somewhere. But when you really start getting down to the to the bare bones of it, you realize that this history is very real and it's still very raw. And for me, um, she was the first, he was the first generation to go into residential school. One, two, three, four generations. I'm the last generation of my family who came out of Indian residential school. First Indian residential school in Calgary called Dumbo Industrial School. He was put in there with his brother Mike Blood. She was the first, first students who were put into St. Mary's Indian Residential School, Catholic Residential Schools on the Blood Reserve, my community, and it goes down from here. And by the time I came along, it just had just, it was sort of like it was just the way it is, you know? Like, I was telling my mom, who passed away about two years ago, I used to ask her, how come, uh, how come you just let me go? You knew that place was really bad. You knew that, you know what happened to you, and why, why did you let me go? You, you had a choice. At this point, they kind of could have a little bit of a choice. But the problem was my parents had absolutely no parenting skills. My mom didn't know how to be a mom. My mom didn't know how to take care of us and, and nurture us and provide us with the things that we needed. So I didn't really have that. And so, and my dad, by the time I was born, he was, they, get kick, they kicked him out of that school at the age of 16. By the time I was born, my dad was already in the jail system. He said he was groomed perfectly for jail. He said the only difference between residential school and jail is in jail you didn't have to pray. <laughs> but it was still the same. You were still told when to get up, when to eat, when to work, when to go to sleep. They were so institutionalized. And it's taken me years of healing for me to be able to talk about this, for me, for me to get out of that blaming the victim. Because that's what we do. And that's not what Freire talks about, you know? The, the, the oppressed people, we start to internalize that and we blame ourselves. 
And um, so, so for us, the Indian residential school really affected us. And one of the things that I, I heard um, Dr. Gaber, Gaber Mate speak one time, and he does a lot of work on indigenous peoples and trauma and, and how it affects them today. And one of the things that he said was, um, he came to speak in our community a couple years ago, and he said, he's Jewish, and his, I think, it, I'm not sure if it's his parents or grandparents survived the Holocaust. And he says, you can't compare the Jewish Holocaust to the residential school. So many times, this is what we're told. We're told, why don't you guys just get over it? Just move on. Just, you know, it's in the past. Don't worry about it. it you know, get on with, with life. I, I, geez, I would love to, but what Matei talks about is he says you can't compare it because this residential school, we're talking about generations, whereas the Holocaust was just for a few years. In a sense, kind of one generation were, were affected by it. But here we're looking at, look at how far back it goes from her being surviving a Holocaust or, or a massacre, then her son, and remember she was a child, smaller than my little granddaughter there. The, 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 those who know her story say she was still a toddler, so she might have been three years old, orphaned on this day. So, um, so I guess, you know, so today, there's this resurgence. It started right, it started, kind of started here. My grandmother, very, very devout Catholic, just, you know, taught us to say our rosaries perfectly. Um, and my dad kind of, my dad was a little bit of a rebel. He kind of started going back to our ways. My grandmother was a member of the Buffalo Women's Society. When she got remarried, this is, her second husband is Bershenbone. That's why they don't have the same last name. But he was a very traditionalist, never spoke any English. And so when she remarried him, he in reintroduced her to our, our ways. And she was a member of the Buffalo Women's Society. Very, very fluent speakers up to here of our language. And so my dad, when he, when he started to um, go back to our ways, so, and I, I can't imagine what it was like for them, but I can only speak from my own experiences. Having been raised in a residential school and having been taught that this was one way, you only see the world this way, and then all of a sudden, things happening in my life where I'm questioning or the very foundation that I'm standing on that I was taught to, to have complete 100% faith in, and I did, and all of a sudden things are happening and what I had faith in just didn't, didn't seem to, it couldn't, it shook. My foundation shook and some of those key events in my life was when I lost my daughter to suicide in 2006. That, if any of you have experienced that, you, you know what I'm talking about. Where did I, where was I able, anybody who goes through something as traumatic as that, I'm the mother. I go downstairs and there's my girl. She was beautiful, 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 22 year old, had two children, three and two years old. And I was, I, I just, at that time I, I, I had no worries. I was living life and normally as possible. But when that moment happened, everything changed for me. And so, how do you go from that to still be relatively okay? I'm still kind of crazy, as Dwayne probably knows. But how do you go from that still being able to function relatively okay? I couldn't do it in what all the stuff that I ha had been taught from the colonizers. I couldn't do it that way. It was in my own realm of elders in a sweat lodge. And my Blackfoot name, many sweat lodge women. It's not uncommon for us to have more than one name. My childhood name that I was given was Crow Woman, Meistaki. And as I got a little older, I, got, I had a dream that I was walking with an elder and he gave me this name, Agesti Skaki. 
many sweat lodge women. And that really was weird for me because traditionally Blackfoot women do not go into sweat lodges. We sit outside at the door. The men will go in a sweat lodge. Naturally, women have a cycle every 28 days. We don't need to purify ourselves. We naturally have that cycle. The men do. They don't, they, the men need to purify themselves. We didn't. But then I was given this name, Many Sweat Lodge Woman, and I was scratching my head and thinking, why was I given this name? Why is that my name? We don't go into, s in fact, I was kind of perplexed and a little bit, kind of a little bit shy to say that was my name because Blackfoot women do not sweat. They do not go into sweats, the sweat lodge ceremony. Well, things have evolved and changed. And there is one ceremony where the Blackfoot women can go into, and that was the ceremony. And this was years before I lost my daughter I got this name, at least about five, six years before I lost my daughter. My name was already had, I already had this name. And then when she passed, like I said, I had no place to go. So I went into the sweat lodge with these elders. And it was in there that I found, I didn't want my daughter to be judged. That was the main thing. Don't, don't you dare tell me my daughter's gonna go to hell because my daughter was beautiful and she was really compassionate, had all those qualities that any young girl, young woman or a mother could ask of her child. She possessed all of those qualities, so don't you dare judge my daughter. And I would get really, really angry back then, still do today. But when I went into the sweat lodge, it was, come, sit here. And in a sweat lodge, we're all on the ground. There's nobody over another person, higher than another person. We all sit there, and the elders would just gently talk to me, allow me to cry. I cried and cried in so many ceremonies. I just would just finally was able to cry and let it out. And it, with them, it was, you know what, it just is. If I could live that philosophy for the rest of my life, that acceptance, it just is, gosh, that's, that's probably going to serve me really well for, my, for the rest of my life. It just is. So I don't need to ask why, how come, should've, I should have did this, I could have done that. You know, I don't ask it. I just, you know, it's just the way it is now, today. So today is today, and this is what I have to deal with, and this is what I do. But. I share those things with you. Someone mentioned earlier there's a lot of us and them. Um, for good reason. And um, for me, the us and them is, it's important for me to teach my grandchildren who we are so that they never forget some of the history, of course some of the teachings, the values that, that Duane has, has shared with you, those values and, and the language. That's the good thing. The other part that's not so good is the racism. And um, in southern Alberta, I don't know what it's like where you guys come from, but where I come from, this color of this skin makes a difference. You get judged. You get, you, you get treated bad. Just recently, uh, I, was, I was on headlines, it was kind of, actually was really, really, didn't, I didn't feel good about it. I'd like to be on, in the headlines, but not for that reason, was because a government official came down to our community and uh, was doing some presentations for us, and when she left, she texted someone that, that she got yelled at in my community, and there was, uh, we were like, was like this, a smaller group, but they were, they were giving us a presentation and she said that she got yelled at and then the person asked by whom and she said by a rabid squaw, Ramona Bighead. And this, is, this isn't just Joe Redneck, okay? This isn't just a guy, gas station, you know, I shouldn't, shouldn't stereotype, but you know what I mean. Uh, they're like, erase that, that part there. Uh, <laughs> um, what I mean, my, what I'm trying to say is this is a person who is educated at the University of Calgary, working for the government of Alberta in Alberta Health Services, which is a huge organization, working in a, pro, in a uh, she's a lead, not just, not just a down the ladder person, but she was a lead in her area. Still talking like that, and this happened last June. 
A week later, she got fired because we spoke up. We didn't let it go. And I have friends, I had, was getting uh, messages all over the world, and my daughter has friends in Samoa who, who were telling my daughter, it's really sad that happened to your mom, but we're really glad it happened to her. <laughs> You know, because they probably knew I was gonna like to speak up. So, <clears throat> um, I guess you know, like all I can say to that is, one of the things in my area of research that I'm doing is I'm realizing how important it is to build relationships. If you want to get to know people, let's say this person who called me a rabid squaw. She just called me a squaw, a rabid squaw, like. <laughs> Anyways, when you really, really think about it, like had she maybe had an opportunity to sit with me and walk with me like you did, go on the land, walking together, sharing stories and listening, prayers and song, maybe had she had that opportunity, maybe just maybe, I don't know, maybe she wouldn't have um, thought of me that way or had the audacity to call me that. Um, I don't know. I like to, my, my thinking, you know, we always like to think the best, or the, take the best in this world, and I, I don't know, maybe it might have made a difference, but, but the importance of building those relationships, um, and it's not just about relationships, and I'm hoping you also understood that yesterday, that just being there, and I hope you can, can kind of reflect on how you felt being at Sundial, or at Women's Buffalo Jump. It's not just about, um, building relationships with you and me. It's the land. And when I, when I went, I went to Sundial and Medicine Wheel alone before you guys all came. I was there a couple days prior to, because um, I needed to go uh, find them, <laughs> you know, because I hadn't been there for a few years. And so when I did, I was there by myself. I did exactly what you guys all did, and I put some tobacco down, and I prayed, and I prepared that site. And I asked, I called on our grandfathers, grandmothers, and I said, you're going to get some visitors here. They're all going to come to this site. All these visitors are going to come, and they're going to come see you. Be ready. They're going to be bringing you tobacco. They're going to be bringing you gifts, offerings. Be ready. So they were ready for you. That site was ready for you. Every one of you, that site already knew you were going to be there. And so when you went there, I hope that you, you walked away with what I did anyway. I walked away and I just felt so good. I felt like all those things I'd been worried about, things I didn't think I could do, I felt, you know, I got this. I, I can do this. I'm working on my dissertation and I'm trying to convince myself, I got this. <laughs> uh, but um, that's how I felt anyway. And, um, and the wind, Dwayne, he never made friends with the wind in southern Alberta. The whole 10, 15 years he was down there, he never made friends with the wind. He was miserable. But if you made friends with the wind, you'll be all right. It's like when I moved to Vancouver, I was told you better make friends with the rain because in Vancouver it's going to rain. And so I went there with that attitude, so I, made, I got to know the rain pretty good. But you know, you make, that's that building that, I guess, that relationship in a good, positive way. And I guess I, you know, I, I, I'll end off here, but I, you know, I really feel for uh, some of the challenges that you're, you're faced with. I feel for the people. Whenever I go to any country in this world, I always ask, who are the, who are the indigenous people of this land? Who are they? Uh, where are they? I'm always asking that. And one time I went to Toronto, and I was hitching a ride with this lady who was taking me to some conference. I can't remember what I was doing down there, but I was riding with her, and I said, who are the indigenous people here? And she says, she's driving this white lady, and she says, oh, they're gone. <laughs> there, there's, there's none. She's driving, and, and, and she's telling me this, right? <laughs> And I just sat there and I said, well, where'd they go? <laughs> and she's like, I don't know. And she, anyway, I found out they're the Mississauga people, people of the, the rivers or something. I'm not sure what it means, but I, found, I went and did some research. So, uh, but we are still here. And for me, I'm really proud 
to be Anitza Tapiaki. And that same pride, you see my sweater, uh, warrior pride, that's the pride that where I'm coming from. And as a principal of the high school where we both started off our careers in education, um, it's, um, that's my, I guess my vision out there is for these students to feel just as proud as, as I do about who we are. Because coming from all of this in residential school, we were told that we weren't given that, that opportunity. But today, it's changing. And in our school district, 100% uh, of all the administrators are from the community. About 90% of all the teachers within all our schools, you have two elementary schools, a middle school, a high school, an alternative school. The majority of the teachers, I'd say about 80% to 90% are from my community. Indigenous people from the community teaching our own children. And that's about, we have a population of about 12, 11, 1200 students within our school district. So you can see what I'm doing, it's also happening in throughout all the schools as well. So I just, I think I'll end off there and thank you for listening. Just, um, just in case I, I don't want to forget about this, I wrote these on here. This is the, the professor that Ramona mentioned, if you want to check. But uh, Leroy Little Bear is, uh, I think I got this, yeah. Uh, Leroy Little Bear is uh, a renowned Blackfoot scholar in this area. He was a professor at the University of Lethbridge. And if you, if you Google him, uh, he has a lecture that's available on YouTube that was given at Arizona State University, and it's, it's about scientific knowledge and Blackfoot knowledge and how they might speak to each other. He's brilliant, and he goes on for a couple of hours. But he, there was a book that was written that was inspired by Leroy. It's called Blackfoot Physics. And in there is a, is a very detailed understanding of Blackfoot under, you know, energy, how it moves, all those kinds of things that might be relevant for some of the things you're working on. Another uh, scholar that a lot of people around here rely on, some of you may have heard, his name is Greg Kahati, and he's from Arizona. He's a Tewa, but he has a book called Look to the Mountain, which is about indigenous scientific knowledge in that context that a lot of people here really kind of rely on as well. So in case you haven't heard of those, I thought I'd share them. Thank you. Um, I think that one of the messages that we are trying to speak to and, and I will let you guys speak is that these are stories of pain, mm -hmm. but they bring compassion. So maybe that's the connection. That mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, <laughs> I'm a little. <laughs> 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 I, not. I just wanted to say thank you uh, to both of you for giving us this experience and this opportunity. Uh, you have shared with us, as Gabby said, painful stories. And uh, I cry all the time, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, thank you for sharing all this knowledge, information, experiences, because uh, <coughs> You took us to a very special places for you, and I just wanted to say I am really grateful for you to prepare the places for us. Uh, when I get to the first place, uh, um, <coughs> I have been feeling really overwhelmed about a lot of things. And as you say before, um, I made friendship a little bit with the wind, <laughs> because I let the wind to take it away, a couple of things. So right now I feel a little uh, more lighter, a little less of a, 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 a more, um, a much more lighter right now. So thank you very much for bringing us here and to have all these experiences. And right now I feel ashamed because um, we have so many things in Guatemala. We have our indigenous people and most of us, most people in Guatemala, we're not proud of them. Uh, most of them, they don't really feel proud of themselves, as you said. So it's so sad that we are 
losing all this knowledge, of, all this traditional knowledge of this, all of this um, wisdom, you know, ancestors' wisdom. So I feel really ashamed right now because I haven't had the time. I I I, I haven't. Uh, take the time to get to know all of my history or to know all of my people. I mean, it's uh, we call ourselves Ladinos, which is a word to separate us from the indigenous people. And it's not a long ago since we changed that to Mestizos. Mm -hmm. Like we are actually that. We are a mixture of who knows what thing, what, 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 what people, you know? So I feel, uh, right now I feel like encouraged to know more about my story, about my people back in Guatemala. So thank you very much for sharing all this with us. Uh, thank you. That's it. Just very quickly to compliment, I think that uh, to me and, and hopefully to, to many of you, uh, the reflections today have uh, uh, moved me to, to even search uh, farther into, into who I am. And, um, and like, like uh, Gabby was saying, um, back in Guatemala, uh, like in many places in Latin America, m most of us are of, uh, of mixed ancestry, but we don't recognize it or we don't even know it. No, I, I was sharing that with, with Ramona yesterday, <coughs> that I know for sure that I have Indian blood in, in, in me, indigenous blood, but I don't know because even if I trace back two or three generations, I cannot identify like you did. I wish I could do that. Uh, but but at least I have a little bit of a light with, with uh, what was shared earlier about this DNA test. I'm, I'm for sure gonna do it. And at least, even if I don't get the names, at least I get the percentages uh, because, because I think it's important that we all realize that um, we, 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 we belong to this world uh, that has this um, history of conflict, but the history in conf of conflict has actually resulted in a blending of cultures. And, and I think that will be the, the way forward. No? The, the, that image that we have there in the screen, uh, that we can truly uh, blend uh, without imposing. No? I, I like what, what you were saying. No? It, it's not a matter of... Uh, me trying to convince you or you trying to convince me. No, it's, it's a matter of uh, being able to, to, to move forward with our uh, beliefs without really um, imposing them on, on the others, but respecting them. And, and, and it's hard because uh, our human nature oftentimes tell us that, no, because I believe this, this, this is the truth and I want to convince you. No? And, and, and I think that's what uh, I, I take from, from the discussion today, among other things, you know, that that we really need to respect each other and respect our beliefs and our, our, uh, our way of seeing the world because we only have one world, so we better share our views if we want to share the same, the same planet. Gaby, ¿tú me traduces, por favor? Sí. Um, bueno, claro, exacto. Um, Quiero traer la, la conversación a cosas que están ocurriendo hoy, hoy día. Estuvimos hace unos días, lo conversamos el desayuno, estuvimos hace unos días eh, en un panel donde se mostraba eh, un poco eh, la opinión sobre el cambio climático. Me dio la impresión de que había un acuerdo entre las partes que estaban exponiendo donde el cambio climático no tiene efectos negativos en Canadá y en definitiva es una oportunidad. Canadá. Sí, eso es lo que el MLA dijo en la reunión. Eso fue lo que se dijo. No afecta a Canadá. O es en una manera positiva. Quería, quería escuchar un poco la opinión de ellos sobre el tema. Y segundo, si se puede referir a lo que estuvimos conversando ayer, Gabriela, sobre eh, este, este proceso que se está llevando a cabo ahora de, de verdad histórica y que al parecer la justicia dice que ese documento no se puede compartir, qué sé yo. ¿Te acuerdas que conversamos? Ah. Sí, eso. So, so two things that he would like to 
would like to hear from you. First, this idea <coughs> of Canada not being as hit as hard as other places with climate change. And then the second one related with these documents, so these hearings that have been happening about the residential school survivors and how that might, well, how is that taken? You can do the climate change. <laughs> you can do the climate change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I was talking with a, a few uh, others about this um, yesterday, I think, and just, uh, I mean, the, the Canadian North, of course, has been dramatically changed, and, and that, that's one of the problems we have in Canada is that uh, people can map the North, but they don't actually consider it part of their world, right, in the same way. And so mo most of what happens in the north of Canada is not on the agenda at all for people who live down, down here. So that's one thing. But uh, for me, I, I have noticed uh, certain things, of course, in our own environment. And in general, I would say the climate is slowly, the conditions are slowly moving north in terms of uh, how, how things are changing. Um, did you want to? Uh, I'll just add that... Uh, one thing I wanted to share is that um, if in 2012, there was a, uh, a delegation of different educators that came from Central America to the University of Lethbridge for a conference. And one of them was, uh, um, they were from Guatemala, I can't remember where, but uh, they brought with them this uh, little old lady. She was, I remember she was very, very tiny. And she did have a chance to speak eventually and through the help of a translator, of course. And what she told us at that time is it, it's 2012, you have nothing to worry about. She said, that the world's not going to end. But what she said was when the Spanish arrived, uh, we went into the caves and we, we, we uh, educated our children in hiding to continue on passing on what we knew they needed to know. What she said is what 2012 means is that it's time for us to come out of the caves now. We have to start to share what, we've, what we know in terms of how, how the world needs to be. And I've thought about that a lot for around here because I would say there's a similar kind of regeneration going on around here. And some of you may have heard of something called Idle, Idle No More, which started on the prairies in Canada. And it had to do with that image there. But it had to do with and not just taking it up as a human-to-human -human problem. And uh, this is another way that people are responding to climate change around here by returning to what I would call natural law and, uh, yeah, what it means to be a human being. So, mm -hmm. Well, I, I just want to address in terms of the residential school. Um, <clears throat> in 2000, oh, geez, was, uh, when was the apology? Eight? Eight. 2008, uh, the government, uh, pre, uh, Prime Minister of Canada made a public apology to all of us who are residential school survivors. Uh, the last residential school closed in uh, 90s, early 90s, I think. And, um, and so for me, I was standing there, I was uh, teaching at the high school at that time. We, we turned on the TV and all of our students got to watch that apology seemed really heartfelt uh it seemed you know like it was it was long past due all the leaders of the different political parties the opposition leaders and so on they all got up and expressed their apologies and on behalf of their an their ancestors who who put us in there but all i could think about was two things number one my dad never lived long enough to hear that apology so my dad never, my dad went to his grave, never fully, uh, nobody ever fully acknowledging that what happened to him was wrong. What they did was just on all levels wrong. My mother, at that moment of the apology, right after work, I was going to get in my vehicle, drive to the city, and go look for her because my mother was an alcoholic. She drank right up until she hurt the end of her life. And she would, when she drank, she would have bouts of sobriety. But when she drank, we have to go look for her at the homeless shelters, the back alleys in the city. That day, when I could hear that apology, that's all I could think about. Geez, I wish my mom was sober today so she could see the prime minister apologizing to her. 
but she never got, they never got to under, fully understand it. So for them, for my mother in particular, I wrote a play about the residential school. It was called um, Ugliest Girl Meets Elvis. That's a whole other story. But she wouldn't come see my play because to her, it was sacrilegious to speak out against residential school abuses because she felt she would be speaking out against her church. She says, you're just going to call down my church in that play. I'm not going to go watch it. So there's still a lot of that, hey? But in terms of the settlement, they did give monies out. They quantified it. You were given so many thousand dollars up until the number of years. Then, they, then you had to go through a hearing, which I personally had to go through. And I'm telling you, I, I, I was a young girl when I left. And then now, uh, just a few years ago, I went for a hearing. And I had to sit in a room with lawyers, with people, and share what happened to me. And, I, and, and you could see I'm very, uh, I like to think I'm very strong, very outspoken, very articulate. But in that meeting, I had to stop them. I said, stop. You're, you're going too fast. You're asking me those questions too fast. Stop. And they shut it down. I had to go outside. There was a lady there, never even met her before in my life. She was uh, there as a, a support um, on behalf of the residential school. And she took me outside. And I had to sit there and I had to calm down and go back in and finish my story in an hour. Then they go back and they deliberate how many dollars to put to my story. And the day I got the settlement check, it was a substantial amount. But I, I didn't feel like I didn't feel like there was justification. I, when I got that check, I just felt, so is this what it was worth? This is the dollar sign the government can put on my experiences and how the things I had to go through to get over that. And so I took it and I just spent it on my six children, all my grandchildren. Bought myself a big TV about that size <laughs> so I could watch basketball. But, you know, I, I just, what I'm trying to say is for a lot of people, I, I, a lot of people who had years of sobriety, we heard of them dropping. A lot of people died, drank themselves to death with the very money that they got. A lot of people spent it friv frivolously because they really didn't give a shit about that money. And that's not what it was about. It was about, what about us? What about these stories? And so for me, it just, I, I just, that's my personal experience with that. Um, but today, there, there are some more funding that I'm trying to access for my students. They're, they're, they had some money left over, apparently $156 million left over from that. Um, and half of that, they decided to put in trust. Maybe because we don't know how to spend money. Um, but they put it in trust on our behalf. Thank you, government. for, <laughs> And then uh, for 20 years, we can't touch it. But the money, the other half, they said we, we all can uh, apply like a grant to access that money, which is very uh, rigorously, um, rigorous, uh, what do you say, categories or criteria. And um, yeah, so. But right now, I think that the, I mean, it's it's not it's not about money. That's the main thing I want to say is that it's not just about money. Just acknowledging it, and allowing us as educators to include it in the curriculum, so that our students, our children, will know that this is not just Indigenous history or Aboriginal history in Canada. The residential school is Canadian history. It's Canadian, non-Indigenous and Indi it's Canadian history. You can't just say, oh, that's just the Aboriginal history of Canada. Bullshit. It's Canadian history. And I better start talk stop talking because when I start swearing, <laughs> it's when I, I better stop. We can have lunch together. 
I'd like to thank very much uh, Dwayne and Ramona for being here with us, sharing you know their view, their culture, their you know receiving us, hosting us for um, our stay here. Um, and uh, one last comment, I think, and, and without knowing what Duane and Ramona were going to talk about, we were discussing the goals of the seminar, you know, and it's all about building relationships, right? We've been talking about this for the past uh, 10 months, building connections, respecting each other's views, uh, knowledge, experiences, bring to the table what you think you can bring to help solving our common problems and goals. So I think it fits perfectly with uh, what you have shared with us, and we thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we have to go because the restaurant, uh, um, I think it closes at 12.30, or there's another huge group. They won't be able to serve you any food. So I would urge you to go to the restaurant and have lunch. 12.30. Um, think about this problem that I laid out here and especially the grassroots thing and a challenge I would have to you would be to wait to think about your research in relation to a, the human being so we know that across the Americas it was an attack on a particular form of human being that we're still trying to come to terms with so how could your research support for example these young girls and becoming strong and, and, and uh, regenerating that particular kind of human being in a community sense how could your research support that in different ways so that uh, yeah we can get some balance back so and by the way you can say thank you in Cree which means uh, I'm glad you're all alive yeah, so thank you yeah.